Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm Andrew Becker, and I will be talking to you today about uh, Man in the Middle, about uh, using Man in the Middle techniques uh, for security and privacy. Let's talk about the agenda a little bit. So why are we here? Um, well, to talk about uh, network security and privacy, and uh, we're going to talk about the various tools of the trade, um, the problems that uh, uh, you will encounter as you try to kind of take hold of your uh, of your privacy and security uh, using network devices, and uh, how can you contact me with uh, with more more information? So, um, first of all, uh, you know why am I giving this talk? Why 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 am I qualified? Uh, I am a principal security consultant with a, a firm called ISEC Partners. We do uh, application uh, network and mobile security. So uh, in my day to day job. Um, uh, I work on things like um, I have reviewed some of the world's largest infrastructure as a service cloud computing services. Right? I uh, look at a lot of web applications, uh, mobile applications. My firm did the original security review of Google Android before it was released to market. So we do a lot of work with uh, wireless carriers, OEMs, uh, other, other uh, application developers. And uh, so in my day-to-day -day job, um, this is you know just what we do. Um, uh, we do uh, source-informed testing, so I almost always have access to source code. Uh, so I use that to try to pinpoint areas that I want to test further. And then I actually have systems uh, under test. Uh, so I typically find myself in the position of having to be the network man in the middle and investigate what's going on uh, with that particular technology. So. Um, also, a little background. So I've been coming to Linux Fest for a long time. I love Linux Fest. It's great. I think um, I've been an attendee since 2003 and a speaker off and on since 2008. I've also been a speaker and trainer at uh, several um, you know, major conferences like Black Hat USA and whatnot. So uh, all right. So what is, what is the problem? right? So our lives continue to be inundated with more and more devices, right? Cell phones, tablets, um, game consoles, streaming media boxes, network attached storage devices. I mean, if you look at the number of digital devices you, know, you interact with on a daily basis, I'm, I'm sure it's exploded compared to 10, 10 years ago, or not to even think you know, 20 years ago, right? It's just it's a lot to keep up with. And these devices do a lot of communication both with um, the parties who you originally procured them from and who developed them, as well as the application uh, developers uh, you, um, you've installed their software, uh, as well as, uh, as third parties that support them. So uh, in the news, you know, it's been a kind of popular uh, subject over the past, especially since about 2010, to start talking about the privacy considerations of, uh, of, the, uh, of um, mobile platforms in specific. And so, you know, iOS, I, I kind of joke that uh, Apple has been introducing a capability-based security model, uh, one congressional hearing at a time. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's like there's location gate, right? They're, you know, you know people are tracking your, you know, they're, they're storing the location on the device and so Congress calls you know whoever from Apple in front of them and they you know promise they'll fix it and then there was the address book debacle right um, so this is uh, yeah been going on for for two years now so eventually you know I, I imagine iOS will have just as many permissions that need to be requested as Android it's just going to take a few more congressional hearings first <laughs> and then uh, the Wall Street Journal did a great series it's been almost two years now I think or maybe a year and a half and they used one of the tools I'm going to talk about today to review a lot of iOS and Android applications and review their network communications and talk about the types of data that were getting transmitted um, using those devices and give people a better understanding. So, um, and then of course Carrier IQ is kind of the, the granddaddy of, you know, privacy issues and mobile platforms in specific, right? So for those who, who are not familiar, uh, Care IQ, they provide, um, they, they gather metrics for uh, wireless carriers. So, you know, everybody likes to complain about drop calls and, you know, service irregularities and, you know, not having access to 3G coverage, getting stuck on edge or whatever, right? Well, Carrier IQ was supposed to, or, or does, provide a service to carriers where they can gain better um, introspection into their network 
network. Uh, the issue was that the Carrier IQ agent software that ran on devices was actually implemented by uh, original equipment manufacturers. And some equipment, original equipment manufacturers are better than others um, at writing software. And so some, uh, Trevor Eckhart uh, found some devices that were just logging an egregious amount of data, like uh, keystrokes, right? We're logging keystrokes to the local device or uh, also uh, URLs uh, that were typed, well, obviously by logging keystrokes, you're logging URLs, right? I mean, it doesn't get a lot worse than that. That stuff wasn't transmitted off device uh, on those particular devices, and I don't know that anyone discovered a device where uh, those had transmitted off device, but, uh, but it was really a big wake-up call for everybody in the mobile industry and in the security industry as far as, you know, kind of the development of these platforms and the security implications of the platforms and kind of what, where we needed to be looking uh, for, for privacy issues. So um, what type of data you know, are we talking about? So in the Carrier IQ case uh, or, or in other mobile cases, you know, um, you know, uh, applications might be transmitting your name, they might be transmitting your address, your phone number, your location, uh, your IMEI, which is uh, it's a unique identifier for your mobile handset equipment, uh, or an IMSI. Uh, IMSI is an incredibly sensitive value uh, that's associated with your SIM, SIM card on GSM networks. It's a subscriber number. Uh, it's so sensitive that when you connect to mobile networks, uh, mobile networks issue you a TIMZ, a temporary IMZ, right? And that's used in place of the IMZ. Uh, address book, as in the case of the uh, iOS scandal, you know, there's there's kind of no reason why when you install a video game that uh, the video game should actually, you know, harvest your entire address book. Of course, they, or at least do it without allowing you to opt out. I mean, I'm all for providing the functionality for you to be able to find your friends and play games together, but uh, I don't know that everybody that installs Solitaire, you know, wants the Solitaire developer to harvest, you know, all of their contacts, right? So, um, so first we're going to talk about sniffing, which is definitely kind of the most, um, you know, the most basic uh, and rudimentary means of, of gather, gathering access to, uh, to data that's transmitted over a network. So we're just talking about a piece of software that can intercept and log traffic uh, on a network, um, you know, and so examples are things like uh, TCP dump. Uh, TCP dump can be really useful if, uh, let's say, you have a, a wireless router that you're running custom firmware on, so you have a shell on it, you know, maybe you can you can install TCP dump on that wireless router and you can start just dumping traffic from the router, which you can later inspect using like Wireshark or something. That's a good way to kind of get a very, you know, uh, rudimentary look at data that's moving over the network. Um, so Wireshark is much better for, uh, for actually, you know, looking at the traffic because um, it has uh, dissectors for specific protocols. So uh, if there's HTTP communication going on, you can actually follow that TCP stream and it will reconstruct uh, all of the TCP packets to put together um, the HTTP text that you can actually read. So then you can say, oh man, this guy's making a GET request and he put my social security number in it, right? <laughs> like uh, those are the types of things you're, you're gonna be looking for. Um, so, you know, how does this work, right? So you would install TCP dump or Wireshark or T-Shark on a device, route traffic through that device. There's a number of ways you might, you might do that, uh, whether, um, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, um, in a bit, and then, uh, and then you do something and then you profit, right? Just like the gnomes, uh, so of, 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 of it, the, the, fan, the infamous gnomes, right? Um, so, so route traffic through a device, but how are you going to do that? That's, that's kind of one of the, always one of the, the gotchas, right, in making any of this happen. So one of the easiest ways I've found is to set up your own Wi-Fi access point that, you know, it could be uh, a machine. You could also do this using ad hoc wireless networking, but frequently devices, um, it's just easier if you have things in infrastructure mode. So uh, having, you know, uh, having a Wi-Fi network, you know, device uh, access point that you have a shell on, that you have some local storage with uh, that you can then when you connect a device to it you know it will uh, you know route all of its traffic through that uh, Wi-Fi access point um, using IP tables you can force traffic in particular directions uh, VPNs can be really useful uh, PPTP uh, is a really simple and easy type of VPN to uh, get up and running you know maybe maybe not the best one to use in a real like v VPN type deployment scenario but for our purposes where you're just like you have a device and you want to funnel all of 
that device's traffic through another box. Uh, PPTP is uh, really quite uh, easy to use. Um, open BTS uh, in a situation where, let's say you have a device that's cellular only, right? So you have a device that does not have Wi-Fi. If it's, uh, if it's a GSM device, uh, Open BTS uses uh, GNU radio um, and it allows you to set up your own uh, GSM base station. Uh, it doesn't support 3G networks, it supports, uh, I think, uh, Edge and GPRS, um, but for about $1,000, maybe $1,300, you too can have your own GSM base station and can uh, inspect the contents of, uh, of uh, communication over that link. Uh, Wireshark has support in it for uh, reading the, uh, the GSM captures that you'll get out of your OpenBTS system. Uh, a local guy uh, down in uh, Seattle, uh, his name is Escape me right now added that support to Wireshark but uh, yeah it's it's pretty awesome and uh, so yes even ARP spoofing so a lot of times when I start talking about man in the middle like people get really excited about ARP spoofing and Ettercap and you know uh, truth of the matter is that uh, you know, generally that's kind of like a last resort or something you only do when you want to man in the middle someone who doesn't want to be man in the middle, <laughs> which you shouldn't be doing, obviously, unless you have permission. So uh, ARP spoofing is something I almost actually never use in a professional setting because it's just kind of a pain and it's not the most reliable. And uh, yeah, you just typically don't have to do it. So uh, yeah, so what I'm going to do here is just kind of, sh for people who haven't seen Wireshark before, I'm going to show you Wireshark. Um, let's see if I can figure out, let's see, I might need to exit this slideshow because uh, I, I just let it decide on the uh, multi-monitor configuration. I have no idea which side is which here. There we go. All right. And so this, if I can drag it all the way over there. Oh, there we go. I should have mirrored my monitor. That would have made everything easier for me. All right. So this is uh, Wireshark. Um, how many of you have used a tool like this before? So a lot of you have. So uh, we may or may not run through this. Yeah, this demo is pretty simple. Um, you know, I'm just going to restart this capture. Um, uh, there's all sorts of traffic on here. Um, I'm actually uh, out of sight. I'm going to open a web browser and I'm going to load, like, I don't know, google.com, which loads. And then if I uh, come over here and scroll down, uh, at the bottom of this, I should see some uh, there's all kinds of good stuff going on. Let's just look at this one. I don't. I have no idea what this is. This is some HTTP traffic, but there's this. Uh, let's see. Follow TCP stream uh, is an option for HTTP, so you do that. And uh, well, I just ended up in the middle of some binary data. But if this had been kind of the beginning of this, that was actually some a continuation of some HTTP traffic. So maybe not the most interesting thing to look at. Um, yeah, I'm just, there's a lot of traffic on this network. So uh, another thing, you might want to use uh, closed network <laughs> when you're doing this, uh, just so you don't have to filter out um, everybody, else's, uh, everybody else's traffic. But uh, yeah, Wireshark's pretty basic. I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time on it. So let's get back into our slideshow. All right, so what are the limitations of sniffing? So uh, first of all, Wireshark's not the most friendly user interface. Um, so if, uh, as you saw, it was kind of a pain to find exactly what you're looking for and you tell it to follow these TCP streams and you're looking at raw HTTP and you have to do that for like every TCP stream, you know, like if you load a web page of a device, you know, um, loads some, some, you know, resources, it might make, you know, a dozen or a hundred HTTP connections, right? And you're gonna have to look at each one of those. And uh, so it's really just kind of a pain and uh, typically just a very brute force approach that uh, I don't, I don't recommend. Um, also, there's the issue of SSL, right? So Wireshark does have an SSL 
cell dissector, but that means you need to get access to key material. And uh, it doesn't have support for like a lot of the other tools we'll talk about actually have support for doing SSL man in the middle. And as far as I know, Wireshark does not have support for that. There's also SSL dump, which is kind of a similar, it's like TCP dump, but for SSL. Uh, and uh, But requires like similar configuration, but doesn't provide you all that much ease of use. And so those are things that exist, but um, I don't use them. And I don't know a lot of other people who use them frequently either. Um, we're going to do a quick like SSL TLS aside, though, because um, this is something uh, that you need to really understand uh, if you're going to be man in the middling uh, traffic. And most people, uh, or a lot of people, kind of feel like they understand SSL, but. Uh, um, given my track record uh, interviewing people for security consulting jobs, who you would think would understand SSL pretty well. Um, it seems like something that the whole world needs a refresher on. So we'll just kind of roll through it pretty quick though. So SSL and TLS provide transport security. So what do I mean by transport security? Well, they provide server authentication. When you connect to uh, linuxfestnorthwest.org over HTTPS, you can be guaranteed with some reasonable level of assurance that you're actually connecting to linuxfestnorthwest.org, right? And not uh, evilhacker.com, right? Uh, masquerading as linuxfest.org, right? It optionally provides client authentication, which is something you know, probably more people in this room than in the general population have experienced, um, just given our professions and whatnot. But uh, optionally, you can have an SSL certificate on the client that you can authenticate to resources with. It's kind of handy and used in a lot of enterprises. It provides privacy, right? It encrypts data on the wire so that uh, that cannot be read um, by any eavesdropper or man in the middle, right? Uh, but privacy uh, and encryption are not the same thing as integrity. Uh, integrity is equally as important as privacy. Uh, in fact, frequently integrity is significantly more important <laughs> than privacy. Um, you know, think about a situation where uh, maybe you're making a bank transfer and uh, you don't care if people know how much money you have, but you don't want anyone to change, <laughs> you know, the amount of that bank transfer or the destination account, right? Integrity is frequently uh, a very important property. Also, you cannot have authentication or authorization without integrity. It's just not, not possible. Also, uh, optionally, SSL provides this really cool property called forward secrecy. Uh, Google makes this available on all their properties where they uh, allow people to use um, a cipher suite, so a suite of, of cryptographic primitives that include uh, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, which means that there's going to be a, uh, a session key negotiated uh, between the client server in such a way that uh, if at any future date uh, the keys from the server or the client are compromised, um, those past communications could not be decrypted. Uh, it's really kind of a, a kind of a fun property, uh, but you know uh, that's just trivia for you. You can you can pull that over, over beer uh, with uh, any security people you know, and uh, yeah, maybe 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 win a round. Um, and so X509 is the file format that SSL certificates are um, perform are are you know written in essentially. I'm not going to go into detail here, but there are just a few things that you need to understand about SSL certificates and how we you know, perform server authentication in order to uh, understand what's actually going on on the wire. So uh, SSL certificates have a subject name that's actually the subject that you're connecting to, the principal. So think linuxfestnorthwest.org, you know, Linuxfest right? They can also have subject alternate names. Uh, so you can actually have a certificate with, uh, I don't know what the limit is on the number of names you can pack into a certificate, but I've seen a lot. Um, they have a validity period, right? They should expire, hopefully, at some reasonable date that's not like the next century. Uh, they have basic constraints. This is whether or not that certificate is a certificate authority or whether it's just you know, um, useful for providing server authentication. There's also key usage and extended key usage, which are really neato properties, but uh, maybe not so important uh, here. I'm not sure why I included those. And an issuer. This is the really important part, right? Uh, SSL certificates are issued by an issuer, a trusted Trent in the, in the parlance of the, of, the, of the cryptographers, or at least the people who read uh, Bruchnir, right? Um, and so um, I don't really want to get too far into, into you know, metaphysics and ontological debates and whatnot, but, uh, you know, um, you know, 
you need to understand kind of the idea that you're, you're trying to connect to a principle, which is an identity. It's a service or something. Um, things get really tricky when we talk about web applications, which may include executable code from multiple sources across the internet. What's actually the identity of an app where most of its active content actually comes from a third party or whatnot. Um, let's, let's not worry about that today. But let's talk about kind of the root of trust. Uh, so we talked about names. These are examples of names, right? So we'll talk about, you know, example.com, something.example.com, something.something.example.com. These are all fully qualified domain names, and these actually provide security, right? Because you can, ver you can verify ownership of a fully qualified domain name, and a certificate authority will only issue you a certificate for that fully qualified domain name that you own. Hopefully, uh, maybe not in the case of Diginotar or uh, <laughs> some other people, but 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 for the most case, yeah. So not names like mail, right, or exchange or internet. Uh, those names are so meaningless in a security sense that cert certificate authorities give you a discount on buying them, right? Uh, and in fact, uh, certificate authorities have agreed uh, to 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 no longer issue short names uh, or any certificates that will be valid after 2015. So. Uh, yeah, SSL certificates for uh, for intranet are, are going away by 2015. Also, not things like 192.168.0.1, right? Who owns that, right? Um, I think, you know, we all own it, right? Um, can't prove ownership of that. Uh, certificate authorities are still going to issue uh, uh, issue certs for IP addresses, but only ones that they can verify, like control over or ownership of. I'm not exactly sure what that looks like, but, uh, but they're going to do it, right? Um, also, I've seen certificates for localhost, and uh, I, I must assume that these just exist like for people that run web apps. You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, mostly I see this from I don't know I don't know that I've ever seen a certificate authority issue one of these, but I've seen enterprise certificate authorities, so internal certificate authorities issue these before, which is funny. Um, so let's see. Oh yeah, so let's get back to this idea of the issuer, right? And so, how does your machine or your software know? who to trust, right? Because uh, we need to game that somehow so that we can man in the middle SSL. So typically you have a trusted root. So this is Firefox's trusted root. Um, one thing I'll point out is that there are a number of CEAs in there that I'm not sure I would trust. Like, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with CNNIC. Uh, that's, a, that's a really controversial subject in Firefox developer circles. It's a, it's a uh, Chinese government uh, affiliated certificate authority who uh, may or may not be connected to uh, malware and other things. And so if you check the bugzilla for Firefox, they just they, there's a raging debate that uh, apparently um, uh, the people lost. But uh, also, the, it's amazing how, many, how much cruft there is in this list, right? Like America, uh, or yeah, AOL is in there. Uh, this one's great. I love this. So like, uh, I've always wondered about, you know, Wells Fargo has their own CA. Realize you guys probably can't read this back in there. The idea is it's a long, long list. But uh, Wells Fargo actually has two certificates in most trust routes. Uh, the funny thing is uh, they don't actually use them. <laughs> I think they get their certificates from like VeriSign or something, right? Uh, yeah, wrap your head around that one. Um, but so how do we man in the middle SSL? Well, we are going to put our own uh, our own trust root, you know, we're going to put our own certificate into that trusted root. We're going to generate a certificate which has the basic constraints set so that it's a certificate authority. It can issue certificates. And then anytime we get a request, we are going to on the fly generate an SSL certificate for that resource. So if you go to google.com, my software is going to go ahead and generate a certificate for google.com. If you go to linuxfestnorthwest.org, I'm going to generate it for that. If you go to becker.org, I'm going to generate it for that on the fly. Um, and so uh, one piece of standalone software, if you want to write some man in the middle tool, um, there's Cybervillain CA is available. My friend Brad Hill wrote it. And so it performs TLS interception attacks. It creates the new certificates on the fly. Um, you might, I can't remember, you might still need to use um, like Bouncy Castle or OpenSSL or something to actually uh, generate the initial CA cert. But, uh, but that's, a, that's kind of also just useful for seeing how like you can go through the code to see how SSL interception works. It's pretty neat. 
And then actually getting your certificate into the trust route. How do you do that? So let's say you're looking at a Windows system. Um, there's the cert manager, uh, uh, which you can use. Uh, also, you may need to update specific applications, um, like Firefox maintains its own trust route. So if you update um, the Windows trust route, uh, you'll get .NET apps, right? Like you, frequently .NET apps will use the system trust store. You'll also get IE, you'll also get Chrome, uh, you'll get a lot of other like applications that specifically target the platform, but, uh, but applications like Firefox or some other applications will frequently use their own trust routes that you need to get into. Uh, on Linux, um, Ubuntu I think has a system trust store, but like Firefox doesn't use it. Um, and so it's, it's a similar situation to, uh, to Windows where you're pretty much, you're updating most applications. Uh, Firefox, it's pretty easy, it's in preferences, you have to go to advanced and there's, there's a place where you can see all the certificates and there's a handy dandy import button where you can import your certificate. Um, Android is kind of a sticky wicket right now, I don't know, how many of you guys have Android phones? It's a lot, yeah I figured, yeah. How many people are running ice cream sandwich? Yeah, not quite as many, but more than the general population, right? I think like 2% of Android devices are Ice Cream Sandwich or something, right? Before Ice Cream Sandwich, there was no built-in ability to add or delete trust routes on Android devices. It just did not, was, you know, you had to root the device, you had to pull the trust route off the device, you had to use Bouncy Castle to edit the trust route and to delete or add things to the trust route uh, frequently on system reboots and definitely at, uh, at any like um, system update, uh, all your changes would get blown away, right? So, you know, DigiNotar gets hacked, you know, certificates for Google and PayPal and all sorts of other people are out there. You want to pull DigiNotar from your trusted route because uh, you know it's not going to you know you're not going to see a system update for like six or eighteen months if ever right you're probably going to trash your phone before you actually see a system update uh, so you want to you want to fix it uh, they don't they don't make it easy for you but ice cream sandwich finally uh, has there actually is built in functionality for managing your trust routes uh, iPhone. Um, you can just uh, email an iPhone user uh, a certificate and they can click on it and they get a nice dialogue and it gets added. They can also, you can also tell them to browse to a link, you can host it on a server uh, and they can install it from there. Also Apple has those enterprise management tools that you can use but given it's so easy to just email somebody a cert or email a device a cert, uh, you can just do that. And then uh, Windows Phone 7, um, there's a project on CodePlex, the WP7 cert installer, uh, that makes it easy to get certificates on Windows Phone 7 devices if uh, you happen to run across one, uh, you know, by chance. Um, and, then, uh, and then other devices, right? This, this stuff gets crazy, right? If we start talking about like, you know, uh, streaming media consoles, if we're talking about game consoles, if we're talking about um, network attached storage, network, network, network attached storage, storage devices, if we're talking about that kind of stuff, it's just going to vary. You know, maybe it's just like Linux, or maybe it's more like Android, right, where, you know, you can find some file that is the trust root, and you can download that and um, use something like Bouncy Castle to edit it. Um, that, that, you know, it's just going to, it's going to vary a lot. And so I spend a lot of time in this territory, like, scratching my head, trying to figure out uh, where the trust root is. So that's, that's the end of my SSL aside. So let's, let's get back into actual man in the middle tools. Um, so web intercepting proxies. Uh, how many people in this room are web application developers? Do we have any web app developers? Have you guys used a web intercepting proxy before? Just to, yeah, to, you know, a lot of people use them to monitor performance of applications. Uh, also, you know, um, they're used in security testing a lot, obviously. They're really useful tools. Um, and so if your application supports uh, so a lot of applications in the mobile space and even like uh, things that are developed in rich internet application frameworks um, will frequently use HTTP for their network communication. And that's awesome because HTTP is easy, right? It's human readable. It's just kind of like just super easy to deal with. And so if that application supports a proxy, uh, which a lot of times things like .NET applications will or Flash applications will, um, then this is kind of your, your, this is the easiest bang for the buck, right? Um, so here are, here's a good list of uh, HTTP intercepting proxies. So like WebScarab and Zap are both open source, uh, written in Java, provided by the Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, pretty easy to use. Um, Burp 
has a lot of features, but it's closed source. It's got a free version and a pro version. Probably don't need to do that um, unless Burp's features are really oriented towards security testing, and so in the context of this conversation, probably don't need to go that way. Fiddler is uh, is Windows only, but I add it here because it has really good NTLM support. So if you were looking at like maybe there was a .NET application, you were really interested in what it was doing, and it was authenticating with NTLM, using Fiddler can sometimes help. Burp has support for NTLM as well, but the support just isn't quite as robust, just because the people you know Fiddler is kind of an in-house tool in uh, Redmond, and so of course it supports NTLM. Uh, Charles runs well in OS 10 if you're, if you're there. People like it. I know people use it professionally. And then Gizmo, I have to plug because my friend Rachel wrote it. And it's definitely the geekiest web intercepting proxy on the list. It's, uh, it's command line only. It's got Vi key bindings. It's, uh, yeah, it's the, it's the real geeks web intercepting proxy. Um, and it's, yeah, it's open. It's lightweight. Uh, it's pretty easy to extend. But uh, yeah, um, just have to plug that one. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is the, the easiest thing to do in the world. Um, so uh, what we'll do, whoops, how did I end up back there? So usually you'll have proxy configuration settings for a platform or for an application. Uh, and so you'll just set those and you'll rock and roll and, uh, and profit, right? So I'm going to... Um, Oh, the limitations. Before I demo it, I should talk about limitations, right? So your application has to support a proxy. Uh, not all applications support proxies, right? And uh, some applications will actually circumvent proxies um, through, you know, if maybe an application is not using HTTP for all of its communication, then you're going to miss something, right? Uh, as well as, so proxies freak out sometimes, and proxies freak applications out sometimes, uh, whether it's through latency or just, you know, other like Java's weird uh, and Java's handling of SSL is weird and so sometimes things go sideways when you're using an HTTP proxy and uh, that's that's not fun uh, and if it's not HTTP then you know this is uh, a moot point um, so now I'm going to show you uh, an HTTP uh, intercepting proxy let's see this is zap I chose it because um, it's uh, open source, uh, freely available, um, and it's kind of, uh, as I said in my notes, it's sort of the the new um, uh, the new uh, web scarab. Let's see. All right, uh, and then the first thing I'm going to do is uh, so I've got Firefox here, which I'll bring over, and uh, oops. Everybody, you know, we know, we know and love this. And uh, so uh, the first thing I have to do is actually configure uh, this thing to use the proxy. So if I go into my preferences, low preferences, and I go into advanced, uh, we've got the network settings, uh, the, the, and here we go. And I actually already have it configured, right? Um, I was just testing this earlier to make sure it worked. But just said it's a local host. Every, every web intercepting proxy decides to use a different port number, and usually you can configure that if you actually have services running on your machine. So Zap by default just uses 8080. Uh, so I'm just going to say, OK, you know, this is all good. I'm ready to go. Um, and so, yeah, so here's Google. Maybe I'll actually, you know, search for something, quite literally something, right? Uh, pops up, and then if we come back over here, uh, we'll see, you know, here is the HTTP request. Um, you know, I've got some cookies in there. Uh, there's a get request, right? Uh, so, you know, I see my parameter in here. I search for something, right? So, you know, in this case, with a get uh, request, you'd be looking at the parameters to see if there's any sensitive data in there. If it was a post request, like a form, or even, you know, applications that aren't web applications will use post requests for, uh, for, you know, submitting data. You'd look at the post body to see what kind of sensitive information was in there. You know, you can inspect the response. Um, but, so let's take a look at what happens when I, um, when I decide that uh, my Google searches are sensitive. And so I'm actually going to visit Google uh, via their HTTP, uh, their SSL protected endpoint, right? So, oh man, right? Firefox is pissed. Uh, this connection is untrusted because uh, it's an untrusted issuer, right? This is the OWASP certificate authority, which, uh, which um, 
Firefox doesn't know anything about, right? And so all I have to do is go into my preferences, uh, same place, except there's this encryption, right? View certificates. This is my, you know, this is my big daddy. We trust a lot of people. I mean, we trust a lot of people, you know? And that list looks long. Uh, what's scary, the first time I ever saw Internet Explorer do this, I was really kind of concerned. Uh, Internet Explorer, when you first look at your certificate list, it's actually really short. And you're like, wow, IE doesn't trust anybody. This is awesome. But the thing is, uh, they have a mechanism in place where they download trust routes on demand from Microsoft servers. So if you, so if you hit like a, the site like firmaprofessional.com, which is actually a certificate authority, um, Microsoft actually, you know, populates. There's a way you can force, you know, the entire list to populate, so you can audit it uh, for your own purposes. But uh, yeah, that was that was disconcerting. So here on my desktop, I just have the certificate. Uh, the first time it ran Zap, it ran this like this wizard. It just popped up, and it's like, hey, you know, you probably need to generate a trusted root. Why don't we do that right now? And so it cranked for a couple minutes, get, or not a couple minutes, a couple seconds, gathered some entropy, generated the certificate. Uh, this is really handy because the people who used to generate these tools used to just ship the same trust route <laughs> with like every copy. And then, you know, like unwitting people would install them as their trust, you know, in their trust routes and then leave themselves open to man in the middle attacks from, you know, anyone who could download a copy of that tool. So uh, we just select that. And so uh, somewhere down in the middle, it just added the O. Wasp uh, trust root uh, to it, which was uh, auto auto generated, and now I'm gonna, you know, try to go to Google. Oh, it should have anyway. Did I not update that? Oh, whoop, there's a there's a dialog I'm not showing you. Um, Firefox really wants to make sure that I know what I'm doing. So they pop up and they're like, okay, what do you want to use this for? I'm going to use it to identify websites. And I say, okay. And so now, now we're ready to go. So uh, now I have my own certificate authority that I'm running and I can man in the middle connections from Firefox or any other application that's using uh, HTTP and is able to be forced to go through uh, an HTTP uh, proxy. Yeah. So. Yeah, if you have this option, it's definitely the easiest one. And now we'll pop back into our slideshow. All right, so this is, this is kind of my favorite um, one. Uh, this is called Mallory. And so Mallory is a tool of a group called Intrepidus. They're a security consulting firm on the, on the East Coast. Uh, it is a transparent TCP and UDP proxy. And uh, it's open source, so you can, uh, I think it's written in Python. Uh, it's pretty easy to check out. There's not a lot of source there. You can, you know, in less than an hour, you can read through it and, you know, recognize that there are no back doors in the security tool and, you know, have a pretty good understanding of how the tool works. Um, it has support for multiple additional protocols beyond just raw TCP and UDP, and, uh, and it's extensible. So if there's a protocol that it doesn't already support, you can add support for it. Uh, Mallory knows SSL, so it has um, something like CyberVillain CA built into it, so it can auto-generate certificates on the fly for any resources that are attempted to be accessed uh, via Mallory. Uh, and, and these are the support, these are the out-of-the-box supported protocols. So it supports HTTP and HTTPS, two of the most commonly used. It supports SSL, obviously. Uh, it supports DNS. That was like one of the first protocols they supported just because it's easy to demo. Um, and then it supports SSH. And then uh, your protocol here, right? So um, you can look at the, you know, the DNS example is a good one to look at as far as like writing your own protocol uh, handler. If you have some goofy protocol or if you're like, man, those Citrix guys, I want to know what they're doing, <laughs> right? So something like that. This is this is where you end up. Um, yeah, your protocol here, so you can implement your own. And so they have this virtual machine that's available that already has their tool on it and running. And then I think they use I forget which um, revision control system source system they use, but you can actually, they already have it set up, so you can just run the update command to get the latest version of Mallory on their minimal VM. And it ships with PPTPD, right? So the daemon for running PPTP. And so like you're, it, you're like, once you get that VM running, you are really ready to go. You just need to configure your device to use that VPN and, and you're set because, uh, so here's, here's the steps in using it, right? So you go to the Intrepidus group, that's their link for 
to directly get Mallory. Set up this minimal VM. I think it's technically for VMware, but I'm sure you could run it in VirtualBox or whatever else. Probably wouldn't be a problem. Uh, you can configure the device, so your, your target device. You configure it to use a VPN. And then uh, by default, they enable their HTTP support. So you know if it's like a cell phone that you're man in the middling, you can just pop open the cell phone's browser, visit some website, and they already have a couple handlers. Uh, so they kind of do an upside down internet thing where they, uh, they reverse all the, all the pictures and they also invert colors. Uh, so that's just to give you like a visual indication that Mallory is actually in operation. Uh, and then you can also look at those components to see how uh, you may, uh, in your work, want to uh, programmatically change um, network communication on the wire. And so Mallory lets you do that. Um, so um, let's see. I'm doing good on time, so I'm actually going to cover this uh, what else section. So sometimes these things, as robust as all of these tools are, they don't cover all the situations. And so API hooking is one technique that people use to do uh, man in the middle. When you have a machine that has software on it and you want to be in the middle, right? Uh, so you will hook like um, on Windows, you'd, you'd hook crypto API, right? The, the specific functions that handle SSL. And so in that way, your software could be the man in the middle for, you know, there's some closed source application that you want to inspect traffic for, but it, you know, it only uses SSL. It has has its own trust route, you can't modify the trust route, you know, you can use, uh, you can hook um, Crypto API to do that. Uh, also, uh, you know, if you're interested in how you do that on Linux, you can Google uh, LD Preload and SSL. Um, a colleague of mine is creating a tool uh, for Android that will do this, that will hook uh, those APIs on Android to make uh, Android testing uh, easier, so uh, I'm not exactly sure what her time frame is for releasing that, um, but uh, yeah, and then uh, Sometimes you end up where you, you just have to patch a binary, right? So if there's like a trusted root in a binary and, uh, and it's not using any system trust root, um, you just, you have to patch it, right? That's, that's, that's where you are, right? Which is a giant pain, and, uh, but that is sometimes, you know, where life takes you. Um, and so in conclusion, we're, I'm going to have time for questions, plenty of time for questions, but um, I just want to say that uh, man in the middle attacks are not uh, magic. You know, frequently when I work with developers, you know, they, they don't realize how simple this stuff really is. You know, they, they maybe haven't used Wireshark in a decade. You know, they maybe haven't ever seen an HTTP intercepting proxy at work. They maybe have, don't even know that Mallory exists, right? And these are all off the shelf tools that have tutorials and FAQs and, you know, there's no reason uh, anyone in this room couldn't, you know, walk right out of here and, you know, go man in the middle of the hell out of some device, right? Um, so, uh, this is my contact information. If anybody has any questions, uh, so my name, my email address, I'm on Twitter, and then um, I uh, looks like I have you know um, more than several minutes for questions. So, do you guys have any? Um, so with Wireshark, I'm running into the um, that it's run out of memory. Yeah. What do you do about that? Well, uh, I would probably try to isolate the device on a network that doesn't have so much traffic. Um, and uh, uh, of course, you can throw memory at the machine. <laughs> um, right. There should be a way, you know, I haven't done this myself. I don't know, maybe somebody in the room knows if there's a way to filter traffic inbound in Wireshark. The default filtering is just a display filter. Yeah. And do it afterwards, but you can set a capture filter. Okay, so a capture filter seems to be your solution. You can also bust them out to files too, just so you can save them to smaller files. Yeah. Use T Shark to do the capture and, and, and specify file size. So like gigafine, you know, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, and so yeah, using T Shark or TCP dump, it, it will. You can say like you know, generate you know, twenty five megabyte files or whatever. T Shark takes less. Thank you. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. yeah, yeah. Chuck. Oh yeah, really simple question for you. How do I, in an SSL transaction after the keys are exchanged, you get a session key that's agreed upon on both sides? Yeah. How do I, if I'm, you know, how do, for research, how do I get that session? Key? It's a good question. Okay. Um, so, I know from reading documentation that um, certain cipher suites that utilize uh, RSA, um, it's it's non 
it's non-trivial, but probably the easiest way you're going to run into is you're going to have to de debug the process, and you're going to have to find out where the key is, right? That's, that's probably the answer. And so um, there may be, yeah, I doubt any browser or rich internet application is going to write that to disk. I mean, it might get swapped, but it's not. Yeah, so I think you, I think you just have to debug the process is where you're at. But there are there are other ways. Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, so with things like SSL dump, um, they have documentation and tell you to use specific cipher suites because of the ease with which you can recover the RSA keys. Um, I could look that up and send it to you later. For an application developer, if they've got an SSL enabled stream, they want to decrypt that to see what's going on. They need the session to be able to do that. Well, yeah, unless unless they've already man in the middle of it by using their own CA and something like Cybervillains or one of the other tools we talked about. Yeah, it's generally better to be proactive and get out ahead in that situation if you can. Yeah. Is um is SSL like public private? Is that how it does the uh, encryption? So it verifies the unvalidated. Yeah, so you get a, you get a you get a public key from the from the server, and you can validate the identity of that public key based on who signed it in your trusted root, and then you use utilize that. Um, so, is there um, a, a public resource for going over um, uh, signing uh, companies to see like their security history? Yeah. Um, so. Firefox has the most open process, and so you can actually, for a particular CA, you can search their Bugzilla, and you can see the discussion that went into adding that certificate authority to. Uh, what, I'll, what you'll find, though, is that the acceptance process is underwhelming. Uh, pretty much you just have to have like a lot of money and some lawyers, and that's what it takes to get into Firefox's trust route. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, how much money? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know an exact an exact figure. Yeah. Which browser would you say comes with, with the best uh, default set of trusters? They're all awful. They're all awful. Yeah. Where's the least? Yeah. Uh, Chrome is the most proactive in fixing these issues. Uh, Chrome does certificate pinning. So for certain properties, specifically Google properties, Chrome will pin to specific you know, um, either certificates or certificate authorities that should have issued those certificates. Uh, also, uh, Chrome has recognized that uh, certificate revocation is completely broken in all of its forms. Both OCSP and CRLs are ineffective uh, against a local network attacker, uh, and so they're actively trying trying to figure out like how do we fix that like, like, um, and the solution probably is not just more certificate pinning in software updates that's probably untenable that's kind of like trying to like update your host file for every new host on the internet right I don't <laughs> I don't know that's going to work but uh, it worked for a while it, 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 yeah for a very little while right? but yeah uh, I'd say they're all pretty bad though yeah, it's just because you can't trust a CA for one particular resource. Yeah, it's just. And what do you see as the most interesting current developments in the in securing uh, networks? Um, I'm really jazzed about the CA browser forum. And so this is a shadowy cabal of certificate authorities and browsers, uh, browser vendors. So Microsoft's there, Firefox is there, Opera's there, Google's there. And so they're actually discussing how to try to solve some of the problems we have with global PKI, uh, which is straining under the scale that we've, we've run it to with situations like DigiNotar and the fact that you know when you trust a certificate authority, you trust it for everything. Um, uh, I think that uh, they're, they're finally taking Taking some steps in the right direction, you know, getting rid of short names, like really trying to harden up, you know, the verification criteria and things like that. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Also, there's some really smart people on the CA browser forum, like uh, Chris Palmer. Uh, also, my friend Brad Hill is an observer there, and so they're doing uh, really good work. Um, that's some stuff I'm excited about. Uh, that's that's just a problem that needs to get solved, and there aren't any easy answers for it. Yeah. They were, I believe they were actually, their infrastructure was compromised and uh, certificates were issued for large uh, internet properties. And it was believed that that was a state actor, an intelligence agency that had performed that attack. Yeah. So were there actually um, servers on the internet that were 
Amendment were effectively you know, impersonating a, a Server, yeah, I don't know that we ever, that in the security community, we ever identified a server that was using one of those rogue certificates, but they almost certainly were in use by the people who made them. Yeah. yeah. And, and did Microsoft in 2000 end up with a couple certificates today? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, if I, if I popped open Firefox and went into the, um, or, or if I had a uh, Microsoft Windows VM and popped open um, the Windows certificate store, you'll see certificates that have been blacklisted. Yeah, and there have been other crazy attacks like uh, Moxie Marlin Spike is a really entertaining security professional and uh, I think it's been almost two years ago now he found this attack called the null prefix attack. So there's a difference between, uh, between how strings were interpreted by two different components and so he could actually insert a null character and confuse a CA's um, uh, issuing um, uh, software into uh, validating one domain but actually issuing a certificate for a different domain. So I I think the way it worked was you put google.com null dot, um, you know, evilhacker.com, right? And so it would validate evilhacker.com, say, you know, set a DNS record, answer an email, do whatever you have to do, right? But then when it actually came to issuing the certificate because of that null character, the name would get truncated and it would actually, it would actually issue a certificate for, you know, google.com, paypal.com. Actually, he did mozilla.com because then he leveraged that to completely compromise Mozilla's uh, software update mechanism. Yeah, that was pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moxie's a good guy, and uh, if you're if you're interested in PKI issues, he's uh, he's he's an authority. Yeah. So you talk about a, a white hat incident. What's that? That was a white hat incident. Yeah. I so yeah. He he gave a presentation at Black Hat USA in like 2010 or 2011 about, or I guess it was 2010 about it, and he reported it ahead of time and Mozilla. You know, I think he reported it ahead of time. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. I'm the next guy. Right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, I'll... Uh, if anybody wants to talk further, I'll be available in the hall for, for questions.